Today on UW 360, the exciting new field of neuroventures and what it means to be a neuro entrepreneur, plus how UW students spent their vacation bringing college to kids on the Olympic Peninsula. Also, the story and job of a lifetime for a Husky grad and accomplished writer who's called the UW home for nearly half a century. And if you want to play like a dog, you got to eat like a dog. Meet the UW team nutritionist who helps fuel Husky athletes for success. Hi everyone, from the University of Washington, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360. NeuroVentures is a growing field that brings together innovations in medicine, engineering, and entrepreneurship and then turns this research into actual products to help medical patients and even athletes. Stacy Sakamoto introduces us to a couple of neuro entrepreneurs and shows us how researchers from the University of Washington are leading the way in this exciting field. What do safer football helmets and treating patients with epilepsy have in common? Those are arteries and veins. They're examples of neuroventures, taking neurological research from the UW Medicine Neurosciences Institute out into the real world. We've had 50 patents over the last five years, and we've developed five companies that are geared at helping patients in treating conditions, curing disease, making diagnoses that we couldn't make before. NeuroVentures is an environment in which I, as a researcher, can work intimately with the medical providers to perform research, development, and to commercialize devices that can help the medical doctors do their job better for their patients. Pierre Murad is a researcher and a neuro-entrepreneur whose ideas have led to the creation of companies. One of them started with a conversation with a pediatric neurosurgeon. We have this problem in pediatric care. We put catheters inside people's brains. It's hard for us to know really where to aim. In a matter of a year and a half, we went from an idea over coffee to a prototype device. About two years after that first coffee conversation, we created a company. That has moved along, and we anticipate first human trials this year. Other neuro ventures could lead to innovative treatments for patients with neurological disorders. Ultrasound delivered through the skull, so completely non-invasive ultrasound, can alter brain function for therapeutic purposes. I have a grant from NIH to study this process, to try to see if this can help uh, alleviate multiple sclerosis. We're working on a uh, passive uh, implant that can treat epilepsy. Neurosciences Institute pediatric neurosurgeon Samuel Browd is one of the leaders in the development of NeuroVentures innovation and big idea thinking. I've been interested in uh, technology around uh, helmets and specifically football helmets to reduce the forces that a player would uh, receive and hopefully uh, down the road uh, reduce the risk of them getting a concussion. The result was a collaboration with the UW Department of Mechanical Engineering and a prototype for a new helmet. Browd co-founded a company called Visus. We don't want to just have science projects going on. We want to take the science and make it real. We're able to take the expertise and knowledge that's here on the clinical side and pair that up with engineering expertise, computer science expertise, and develop these things that have enormous value. The expertise of the UW's neuroentrepreneurs expands the influence of the UW Medicine Neurosciences Institute far beyond campus. Clinicians and researchers hope it could change patient care around the world. The field of neuroventures has attracted so much interest that Dr. Browd even taught a class in neuroventures here at the UW to help students start their own neuro-related businesses. Still to come, meet one of the most important coaches for every Husky athlete, the one who teaches them how to eat like a champion. And see how these UW students spent their vacations getting kids excited about college by bringing college to them. 
plus one student's drive and determination to earn his Ph.D. in history with the special support of the UW Special Collections Labor Archives as UW 360 continues. The following UW 360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money. Welcome back to UW 360. Several years ago, we brought you a story here on 360 about a group of students who spent their spring break volunteering at a school in eastern Washington. That story inspired a UW faculty member from the Department of Human-Centered Design and Engineering to launch his own project. He organized a teaching trip like that one in eastern Washington for his students on the Olympic Peninsula this year. Here's their story in their own words. In uh, the spring of 2017, we participated in a project called the Pipeline Project, Alternative Spring Break Program, and we took a group of our undergraduate students out to Nia Bay for a week to lead a design thinking workshop for their middle school out there. We're going to focus on brainstorming or forming ideas, so trying to figure out um, what app you're going to create the rest of the week. We were really looking at how do we engage the local K-12 schools and we really started thinking like it's great for those students that are nearby because they can come to the UW and see what's going on but for those who really are out in rural Washington um, they really don't have access. I am the first one in my family to go to college especially go to an engineering school and I was really motivated to be part of this because I wanted other students to know about this to know that they have career options. I was taught as a young child that you lift as you climb, meaning as you go on to higher degrees or higher expectations, you pull someone with you and assist them in one way, because if you're not there to help them, who else is going to be there? It's looking good. It's awesome. Me, as a second generation citizen, I've had a lot of opportunities and I want to make sure that other people that don't have those opportunities have similar chances to get what I have. I'm also Indigenous, and so I'm Native American. And so, um, for me, this is one of the ways to connect with Native people in the Pacific Northwest because my tribe is in the Midwest. So the idea is to put one user or one individual... To the goal of the week was to go from, uh, to build an app from the very beginning concept to delivery, but it was more focused on the process of how we design something rather than just creating an app. So you can drag back and forth and choose which screen you think it should go to. The emphasis of human-centered design is that we try to solve problems problems using technology by putting the users first and understanding the needs that people have in their current uh, lives and trying to find technology solutions. Some of them said, well, we could make um, an app that would help people track the salmon so that we could understand, you know, the migration pattern. One team did something about learning them, an app to help people learn the Macaw language. We learn as much from the middle school students as they learn from us. From a culture level, they were constantly teaching us things about the Macaw culture. What I enjoyed was seeing the change that they had in the way they thought. Because in the beginning of the week when I talked to a lot of the students, a lot of them would say that a lot of people don't go to college in that area. And at the end of the week, a lot of the kids were like asking like, oh, how's college? Like, what are you? I'm so excited to be able to go. And they were really interested in knowing more about UW. I think I really liked seeing our students be teachers and be inspiring as mentors to all those, uh, all those kids who were so appreciative and grow up, you know, so isolated from all this stuff. This experience ranks as like the top number one experience I've had in my whole college life. I actually took a picture jumping up because I was so happy. It brought so much peacefulness and so much beauty into my life. This year's trip was such a success that the Department of Human-Centered Design and Engineering is hoping to continue the program and even expand it next year. All right, from one success story to another. Nearly half a century after arriving on the UW campus as an undergrad, one man is still here with no plans to leave and plenty of stories to tell. 47 years. Selling at the University Bookstore's hub outlet 
and Nick DiMartino's passion for sharing recommended reading is obvious. The places in between, he decided he could prove that he could walk through Afghanistan without a weapon, and he would make it, and he did it, and it is <laughs> so touching. For an examination of a 66-year friendship between two women, I, I don't know of anything that compares. I recommend a book called The Red Collar. I revere Doctors Without Borders. So when I found out he had written a novel and it had a dog in it, to me it was everything I could want. Along with Nick's picks, he is just as likely to recommend a classic, such as Gone with the Wind. I put them up there under prize winners uh, that's what I, I like to call my classics, just so that people don't feel that, that they're just stuffy old books, but they see that actually they're, they're great books that won awards. Nick came to the UW campus as an undergrad in the mid-60s and found his way to the English department in Padelford Hall. Thank God I had a teacher that encouraged me to read Proust. So that was probably the pinnacle of my reading. My connection is with the English department. After earning a degree in English literature, Nick received a scholarship to an out-of-state school. And after uh, a semester there, I realized that uh, what I wanted to do was write books. So I came back and decided I'll work at the bookstore until I write my first bestseller, and that's just how it will be. That was 1970. Nick is now a playwright and author of nearly 20 titles. Many feature Seattle, the University District, and the UW campus. A recent novel, The Professor's Wife. And on page one, he catches his wife in a very small lie. And because she runs the bookstore in my novel, and her husband works here in Pedalford Hall, there's constant interaction between the two buildings, as there is in life. Many of my customers work here. Just two blocks from Padelford Hall, the hub is the setting for Nick's mystery, Student Union. Campus police headquarters had been farther away than she remembered. The Bryant Building was perched on a curving, tree-lined back street on Portage Bay. Nick's book, Ghost Stories, set in the U District, has been his personal bestseller. Uh, at the University Bookstore, it was the number one paperback sold in the year it came out, 1998. Nick didn't leave the bookstore after that best-selling status. He's now past retirement age and still with no plans to quit. I feel like if I can have the best selection of books here and get young people to realize what they can get out of those books, I can sort of pay back what I've had because they've been the greatest joy of my life. If you'd like to talk books with Nick, just drop by the Hub Bookstore. He also hosts two book clubs, one in the University District and one on Capitol Hill. Still ahead, what does it take to earn one of education's highest degrees? We'll look at one student's drive and determination to earn his PhD. And if you want to play like a champion, you got to eat like one. Meet the Husky Teen Nutritionist as UW 360 continues. Support for UW360 is provided by the Labor Archives of Washington. Learn more about researching at the Labor Archives and donating collections at laborarchives.org. Welcome back to UW360. University of Washington teachers are leaders in their fields. Their research pushes the boundaries of knowledge and they make the UW one of the most innovative universities in the world. The UW has generated seven Nobel laureates, 81 members of the National Academy of Sciences, 91 members of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and billions of dollars in research funding every year. So imagine what it must feel like for students to begin working and presenting with their rock star professors as they work toward their PhDs. Austin Seedentoff shows us one student's journey to attain his Ph.D. in the Department of History. The defense was attempting to prove... Josue Estrada is a fifth-year graduate student studying history. 
Today, he presents his work at the Labor and Working Class History Association's conference, hosted at the UW, one of the largest conferences in his area of study. I mean, it's a great opportunity for me to be able to network with other scholars who are not only in my field, but in other fields, but who are also doing important work about the working class. And his most current book is... Excellent group of people, a lot of top scholars, a lot of really smart people, a lot of accomplished people, a lot of people who are coming up who are going to be the future of the field. You get uh, acculturated into the world of being a scholar at a conference like this in a way that you can't just get in the classroom. The MAF leaders say, hold on a second. Josue earned the opportunity to speak in a panel at the Lodge Conference because of his study of voter suppression in his hometown of Yakima. I received an unnerving phone call from a lawyer, but she let me know that uh, she was part of a legal team suing the city of Yakima, arguing that a history of racism and the at-large election system there violated the Voting Rights Act and also diluted the voting power of Latinos. Then she told Josue something he could never have expected. Someone had misconstrued a quote from an old master's thesis he'd written to argue that there was no history of racism in Yakima. It was a paper that I completely had forgotten about. I was asked to give a deposition statement um, to refute how my evidence was, my research was being used, and also talked about the experience of the, the racism I experienced there living in, in Yakima County. A federal judge ruled that the election system in the city of Yakima had diluted the power of Latinos to vote, and a newly reformed election system led to two Latinas being voted onto the city council for the first time ever. This experience got me interested in writing this history about the history of Latino voter suppression in Washington state. I'm looking at, it's a, almost a very simple question, is how did Latinos win voting rights? Josue's new research venture took him to the closest available source for first-hand documents, the UW's Labor Archives of Washington. The archives here are so expansive. There is uh, almost an infinite uh, set of resources for new kinds of research projects. There's content here. I don't have to travel. I don't have to spend time and energy going to another site where everything's on campus. It's, it's local. Since digging through the archives, Josue's work has expanded to track the evolution of Latino and Puerto Rican voting rights across the country. And he is driven by a desire to make a difference. I know the power that research has and how a narrative can easily be distorted. The AG wrote that... So they were kind of carrying on the mission as scholars of producing knowledge that enlightens the world about the hardships of working people and people who are marginalized and discriminated against and exploited, but also tell stories about the possibilities under some circumstances for change in those conditions. No, we can't be ignored anymore. It's also influenced by my desire to continue to possibly create research that can once again potentially have an impact on policy. Josue is set to complete his PhD in about a year and a half. He then plans to lead a Latino or Chicano studies program and maybe one day oversee a state or federal program supporting underrepresented students. Straight ahead, if you want to compete, you got to watch what you eat. Meet the woman who makes sure Husky athletes are fueled for success as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. College life can be a grind. There's class time, study time, work time, and of course personal time. And college students aren't exactly known for taking time to eat well. But if you're a student athlete, eating well is critical for success, which is why the University of Washington depends on one talented woman with one tough crew to make sure those student athletes get what they need. Well, this one's also protein, so it's got the beef in it too. So then if you do this, I also want you to do either a little bit of chicken or a little meatballs with it. Make sure we're getting enough protein in there. Next week, we're gonna do a little Caribbean flair, get some Puerto Rican food in here. Hi, I'm Emma Fake. I'm the Director of Sports Nutrition for the University of Washington Athletic Department. You have Mexican food? Yeah. So it didn't sit well, or? My main job is to help 
educate and teach the athletes how to fuel their bodies, both for competition, for training, for everyday life. Uh, we do a lot of work with our athletes for what happens after athletics, whether that means you're going to the NFL or you're getting a job. You know, they say you can't outwork a bad diet. We try to think of nutrition as just as kind of an important pillar, just like sports medicine is, just like the coaching piece is. If you're not fueling your body for endurance, you're not fueling your body for strength, then you're not going to be able to perform at that level out on the field or on the track or on the court or whatever it might be. All right, everybody, protein power, protein power, get recovered. They're full-time students. They have uh, GPA requirements. You know, they're going to tutoring, academic advising, they're practicing, they're doing treatment to make sure their bodies are recovered and healing and feeling good. A lot of my job is trying to find time that it's not adding to what else they're doing. I'm good with salad. Yeah, she's tough. Um, she'll 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 know. Uh, she wants you to eat right. She she's like a little bug that just you can't scratch. Uh, you know, always always talking to you, always getting you the right food. So it's it's uh, it's definitely huge for me. Huge huge benefit to have her here. Um, I think the toughest part is that there's so much noise about nutrition out there. You know, everybody's a nutritionist. Everybody wants to talk about the latest fad diet, the best supplement. So really helping our student athletes filter that out. Um, and, and customize what they're doing for them and saying, you know, don't follow the crowd, you know, be really careful where you're getting your information from and what kind of information you're getting because it's not always safe, it's not always reliable, it's not always backed by scientific evidence. I always say I have the best seat in the house. Our amazing supporters come out and they see our athletes perform and they see them win and, you know, they see the outcome of all this hard work, but I get to see it day in and day out and I get to see these athletes and, you know, how hard they're going in the gym or on the court or in the training room and all the blood, sweat and tears that goes into that. Yep. And that's so rewarding to see the behind the scenes work. As you just heard, Emma and her crew get rave reviews from the players and coaches who say they greatly appreciate all the hard work she puts in to make sure they are fueled and ready to compete. And that does it for this edition of UW360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.